about Captain Jack, some true, others probably romantic falsehood. One romantic tale has Captain Jack counseling the other Modocs against war with the whites. This speech undoubtedly was never made by Captain Jack. He was supposed to have made this speech when he was just a boy. But like many myths, it contains much in the way of truth. I am a Modoc. I am not afraid of the pale faces. But we do wrong to kill them. They do not know we are Modocs. They kill our people for wrongs other tribes have done. They are many, like grass on the hillside. We cannot kill them all. More will come. If we fight them, they will not rest until all the Modocs are dead. Some conflicts were bound to occur. Evidently, some horses were stolen from white men and Modocs were seen with the same horses. The Modocs claimed they bought the horses from Pitt River Indians, and the Pitt River Indians said they got the horses from the snakes. In any event, some settlers killed some Modocs for stealing horses. The Modocs fought their revenge at Bloody Point. Many attacks were made here from Bloody Point until immigrants grew wary and camped further to the west where they could see their enemies if they were going to be attacked. There were no legends about Bloody Point. It was all true, and except for some confusion about its exact location and the number of people killed there, it probably was the grimmest spot in the history of immigrant travel along the southern route. In this particular attack, the bodies of the immigrants were mutilated some settlers managed to escape the Modoc revenge, however, and these settlers survived the brutal trek to Wairika, where they told the citizens of this little town what the Modocs did. It was 1852, and Wairika was a gold rush town, filled with miners and adventurers. The story of the Indian, Indian attack outraged many of the citizens in Wairika, but especially it outraged Ben Wright, who by then was noted for his hatred of Indians and his skills as an Indian fighter. In late November of 1852, Ben Wright organized an attack of the Modocs that would be remembered by the Modocs as a major cause for their fight against the whites. Early in the morning, Wright walked boldly into the camp of the Indians who were drying meat for their winter food supply. They scowled at him but made no attempt to harm him. Wright was dressed in his ordinary clothes with his head sticking through a hole in a blanket which he was using as a crude overcoat. The blanket also served to conceal a pistol he held in his hands. He had told his men that he was going to make one last demand. If he was refused, he would shoot the Modoc leader. Since old Sconchin, the head man, was absent, Wright went to the man who was next most important and made his demand. When he was curtly refused, Wright fired twice through the blanket. The Indian fell dead, and the white men on the banks opened fire as their leader withdrew from the Indian camp. The Modocs were in a panic. Some tried to seize their bows, but many just ran. One of these survivors, however, was Skunch and John, shown here, brother of the chief and during the Modoc War, second in command to Captain Jack. The white men 
scalped their dead enemies, mutilated their bodies, and returned to Irika, dirty, shaggy, brown, and noisy, waving the scalps as they came. Wright was a hero. The miners took off a week, and for seven days, the town staged a wild carousal. The drunken fights grew so fierce, and so much furniture was broken, that the cooler and soberer citizens began to restore order. Little by little, the celebration led up. The volunteer company was discharged on November 29th. After this fight, the Modocs were quiet for some time, especially with the settlers of Northern California. As for Ben Wright, he was to continue his career as an Indian fighter. His fame grew until finally the Interior Department appointed Ben Wright as Indian agent in charge of all tribes south of Coos Bay on the Oregon coast. To these Indians, his appointment was tantamount to a declaration of an extermination policy. And it was in his capacity as Indian agent in Gold Beach that Wright himself became a victim of an atrocity. The day after Washington's birthday of 1856, Fremont's old guide, Enos, trusted by Wright, led a massacre of 25 whites at Gold Beach. Enos personally killed Wright with an ax, mutilated his corpse, cut out his heart, and cooked and served it to his fellow rebels. The Modocs, meanwhile, were rapidly adopting the customs and habits of white settlers. One Indian girl, shown here, Wainema, cousin of Captain Jack, married a Wairika prospector by the name of Frank Riddle. Both Wainema and Riddle provided invaluable service as interpreter for the peace negotiators during the later Modoc War. Wainema's cousin, Kintapus, was nicknamed Captain Jack. Captain Jack was particularly friendly with Elisha Steele, a Wairika lawyer, and pictured here, Judge Roseboro, who tried to stop the Modoc War before it got out of hand. Queen Mary, pictured here in the center between two of Captain Jack's wives, also lived in Wairika at this time. The Modocs then got along peacefully with Wairikans. This is ironic, of course, considering how the Wairikans were at least partially responsible for the Ben Wright massacre of the Modocs. Nonetheless, the best friend the Modocs had among the whites were Steele and Judge Roseboro of Wairika, and the Fairchilds and Doris family of the Butte Valley also earned the respect of the Modocs. Judge Fairchild, shown here with three Modocs to his left, was the Californian who worked very hard to avoid the Modoc War. He is one of the unsung heroes of the war. Oregonians, however, were a different story for the Modocs. Jack's whole way of life conflicted with the, that of the Oregon settlers who wanted title to land for farming and raising stock. As long as the Indians roved their traditional hunting grounds, there was always the possibility of conflict. Farmers had no time to fight and did not want their wives and daughters to live in constant danger. They demanded, as a result, that the Indians be put on a reservation where they could be watched by the army when it could once again be stationed along the frontier. Old Scotian was willing to yield to the pressure of the Oregonians, to forsake his wandering ways and to settle on a reservation. This Captain Jack would not do, and he and his young men were encouraged by the old shamans who felt their power slipping as more and more the white man's ways were taken up by the Indians. Over the basic issue of whether or not to go to a reservation, the rivalry between Jack and Old Scotchin began. peace commissioner by the government. He promised Captain Jack and his Modocs that life on the reservation would be free from harassment by the Klamaths who shared the reservation. Meacham, however, could not stop the Klamaths from taunting the Modocs about not having a home of their own. Finally, angered at the vicious taunting, the Modocs left the reservation and settled once again in the Lost River area. The Modocs wanted their own reservation on the Lost River. Losing patience with government delay in granting a reservation, the Modocs once again began to harass the Oregon settlers. In 
July of 1872, troops led by Meacham were sent to bring in Captain Jack. By this time, both sides were nervous and expecting treachery. It appeared as if the Modocs might surrender, but the situation was precarious. Richard Dillon provides this account of the morning of November 29, 1872, when a soldier of the U.S. Cavalry and Scarface Charlie faced each other in the chilly Modoc Valley. The commander ordered Botel to take four men from the left wing of the line of troops and to arrest the Modoc leaders, the many called the Modoc's boldest spirits. The latter stood in a line about 30 yards in front of the dismounted cavalrymen who were deployed as skirmishers. According to the lieutenant, he said not a word to Charlie. Both A.B. Meacham and Jeff Riddle agreed that, as Boutel advanced, Charlie dropped his rifle onto the pile of arms on the ground. But according to Riddle, not before Jackson roared to Boutel, take the gun away from him, and the lieutenant snapped, you black son of a bitch, lay down your rifle. When Captain Jackson ordered him to drop the pistol in his belt, Scarface Charlie refused and retorted, you got my gun, the pistol all right, me no shoot you. Jackson made no response, but ordered Boutel to disarm the Indian. The lieutenant stepped forward and said, here, Injun, give that pistol here, damn you quick. Scarface Charlie laughed, but there was no laughter in his dark eyes. Me no dog, me man, talk to me like man. Me no afraid you, you talk to me just like dog, me no dog. He then held out the equivalent of an olive, olive branch to the hot-tempered officer. Talk me good. I listen to you. But Boutel was enraged. He drew his revolver and cocked it. You son of a bitch, I'll show you not to talk back to me. Scarface Charlie did not flinch, but repeated, me no dog, you no shoot me, me keep pistol, you no get him, pistol. Boutel leveled his weapon at Charlie's chest and squeezed the trigger. Scarface Charlie fired at the same time. In the mounting confusion, Captain Jack escaped and fled to the lava beds. While he was leading a group of Modocs over the waters of Tule Lake to the stronghold, some soldiers attacked the group of Indian dwellings. This upset Hooker Jim, shown here. Hooker Jim was a Modoc with a hair-trigger temper. Hooker Jim led a band of Modocs on a rampage of revenge. The soldiers killed innocent villagers. The Modocs killed innocent settlers. The date was November 29th, 1872. The Modoc War was now a reality. seemed to be heavily against the Modocs. Less than 100 Indians faced 10 times as many soldiers. However, the Modocs had some advantages. They knew the lava beds, and most of the trails leading into this natural fortress were known only to them. The clefts in the lava are like crevices in a glacier, formed as the solidified crust of the flow was dragged forward by movement of the still molten lava beneath. These fissures make the one half square mile stronghold a fortress. Attack from any direction was very difficult. From a distance, the terrain looked deceptively even and easily negotiable. The attacking soldiers soon found, however, that the deep crevices and jagged boulders were terrible obstacles to negotiate under fire. Here is a map of Captain Jack's stronghold. The stronghold was located at the northern edge of the lava beds. The lake at that time was only a short distance to the north. As the soldiers were to find out shortly, this stronghold was an almost impregnable defensive position. Moreover, there was plenty of food in the stronghold. 
The Indians had herds of cattle within the deep gorges, so meat was plentiful. The ice caves and a subterranean river within the lava beds provided more than enough water. Harry Wells, who wrote the history of Siskiyou County, gives this description of the lava beds. The weird rock formations gave excellent protection and the many pinnacles made perfect lookout posts. An Indian could fire a gun and disappear without ever having been seen and reappear a few moments later at some other advantageous point. From the high rocks, the Indians could watch the movements of the troops five miles away and not be seen themselves. Thus, during the whole campaign, they knew in advance the plans of the soldiers, and because of their ability to move secretly and rapidly from place to place, they could take advantage of any carelessness or exposure of their enemy. It should be borne in mind that they were con firmly convinced they were fighting for their liberty and for their very lives. December of 1872, a group of soldiers and volunteers readied themselves to attack this stronghold. An army of 250 regulars were led by General Frank Wheaton, whose headquarters were at the Van Bremer Ranch. Volunteers from Oregon were headed by General J.E. Ross. Fairchild's and Doris led the California volunteers. General Gillum's headquarters were at the Fairchild's Ranch. The first attack against the stronghold on January 17, 1873, resulted in no Indian casualties. The soldiers lost uh, at least 10 killed and about 30 wounded. The attack was, was foiled by heavy fog and poor communication. The soldiers were overconfident. Fairchilds, shown here, gave this account of the battle to a friend in Myrica. I have conversed with several officers, old Indian fighters, who say they never saw Indians fight as the Modocs fought the other day. The day was very unfavorable. The fog was so dense we could not see 50 yards. As we charged the Indians, they could hear the command of our officers and always tell where we were, and we could not see them. At first we would know we would receive a deadly volley. I have been in many good, close places, but that beat anything I ever saw. Our boys were in the hottest of the fight. I am in hopes Governor Booth will change his mind and let us raise some troops. I think the officers believed Doris and myself that told them the facts about the Indians and their stronghold. The Indians would fire and fall back. Colonel Green took more chances than any man I ever saw. He walked the lines and gave his orders during the hottest of the fight and never took shelter or dodged. It looked like a miracle he escaped. And so the first battle of the stronghold ended. The Modocs obviously were not to be taken lightly. The news of the, of the defeat caused some panic in the area. The overconfidence of January 16th became the panic of January 18th. Some voiced a fear that even Wairika was not safe from the depredations of the Modocs. And if Wairika was vulnerable, why not Portland? Why not San Francisco? Bragging decreased. Desertions increased. By February, a peace commission had assembled at Ben Bremer's ranch. Hostilities ceased and preparations for a meeting between the Modocs and the members of the peace commission began. Meacham headed the peace commission and General Canby, shown here, was in full command of the military. Captain Jack, however, insisted that his old friends Steele and Fairchilds be present at any peace meetings. Although Steele and Fairchilds often enjoyed Captain Jack's company when he was younger, they had little illusions about his dangerousness. They both knew the Monarchs could kill even former friends under these threatening circumstances, especially if the negotiations were held in the lava beds instead of a more neutral area. However, word came that the Modocs were willing to surrender as prisoners of war. Fairchild remained pessimistic. Steele was ready to give the Modocs one last chance. He even went so far as to visit the Modocs 
in the stronghold. By the time he got there, he realized his mistake. Fairchild's had been right to be pessimistic. Only Scarface Charlie and two of his Confederates appeared to still be friendly. And like Jack, they were in a difficult position, for the mood of the majority was an ugly one. Jack rebuked Steele for missing some of his words. He told them that the Modocs had not yet shown their hearts. The surly John Scunchin, looking for trouble as usual, accused Steele of duplicity and lying in a violent and inflammable tirade that led Modoc hands to play with pistol butts and knife handles. The squire spoke only in English and Chinook, which had to be translated for many of the Modocs in order that his adversaries might not know how much he understood of their threatening talk in the Modoc tongue. Testily, he said that he would never misrepresent his Modoc friends, then coolly terminated the interview by saying to the blackguard, I do not want to talk to a man when his heart is bad. We will talk again tomorrow. Atwell described Skunch and John. The old heathen chafed and fumed like a caged tiger. Shortly, the old heathen asked Steele if he was not afraid to sleep in the Modoc camp after talking to them with two hearts. The last subject Steele again denied, then said he was afraid of nothing. With good timing, Scarface Charlie intervened to suggest that Steele and his companions led down in Captain Jack's camp. With Queen Mary and Jack, he then stood guard. Several times during a sleepless night, Steele looked up from his blankets to see one or the other of the threesome on alert sentry duty. Atwell swore, to the protection of these three Indians, I am satisfied we owed our safety. The Murdoch squaw, Artina Chokas, said the same thing. Although Jack was rather hostile when compared to Scarface Charlie, he had a well-developed sense of honor and vowed that men who came to his campfire would be protected. Steele was certain now that the Modocs were not about to surrender. He warned Canby and Meacham not to meet with the Modocs. At last, however, on April 2nd, 1873, the Peace Commission met at a halfway point between the Army headquarters and Captain Jack's stronghold. This meeting came to little, since the Modocs now saw themselves as determined and strong, and the U.S. Army as weak and vacillating. The Modocs left the meeting in anger because they could not have their Lost River Reservation. The final meeting of the Peace Commission took place on April 11th. By now, the Modocs were definitely committed to war. In an act of treachery rep reminiscent of the Ben Wright massacres of Modocs 20 years earlier, Captain Jack murdered General Canby while under a flag of truce. William Simpson, a correspondent for a London newspaper, drew this picture of the murder scene. Captain Jack misfired once, but then he shot General Canby in the head. Boston Charlie then killed Dr. Thomas. Meacham was shot in the face, but miraculously, he survived. The news of this killing shocked the nation. Erwin Thompson, author of A Military History of the Modoc War, offers this explanation for the slaughter of the peace commissioners. Captain Jack had argued against the scheme when it was first proposed, probably by Scotch and John. Jack and those who supported him could not be sure that these deaths would serve the Modoc cause. However, Canby's gradual compression of the past two months had had the effect of strengthening Scotch and John's arguments. As the noose grew tighter, the Modocs had fewer alternatives and less to lose. They were surrounded by hundreds of troops, troops that were moving even closer. Many of the Modocs had been indicted for murder in Oregon. Should they surrender, they would die at the end of a rope. The peace commissioners could not satisfactorily guarantee their future safety. Desperation was the force that drove the extremists to conclude, however rashly, that a simultaneous blow against the army leaders of both camps and the peace commissioners would be so devastating that the troops would have to leave. A humiliated Jack's Captain Jack finally went along with this madness. When Jack had first refused to participate, an Indian put a squirrel's hat on his head and another threw a shawl over his shoulders. They tripped him and threw him down on, the, on his back and taunted him. Captain Jack still had his manhood. He joined them, saying that he himself would kill Canby. The soldiers were now given orders to pursue Modocs with all diligence. And according to General Sherman, hero of the Civil War, the soldiers would be fully justified in the utter extermination of the Modocs. 
It was one thing to get permission to defeat the Modocs. It was another thing even to find them. At least three times they were surrounded, seemingly beaten. Each time the Modocs were able to slip away through the lava beds they knew so well, inflicting heavy casualties on the soldiers as they escaped. But the mood of the war was changing. The Modocs were on the defensive. Hooker Jim, Bogus Charlie, Scarface Charlie, Shaq Nasty Jim, Steamboat Jim, Steamboat Frank, eight other men and their families rode toward the mountains west of Van Brimmers after an argument over who was responsible for the deaths of one of the Braves. The Modocs were split now into two groups. Captain Jack, Scunch and John, Black Jim, and their group remained for the moment in the lava flow north of today's Big Sand Butte. The first group surrendered to Fairchild's in May. Fairchild's learned from this group the whereabouts of Captain Jack. The soldiers now closed in for the kill. Scarface Charlie, military genius of the Modoc campaign, and one half of the remaining Modoc surrendered. Captain Jack's turn came on June 4th, along with some starving women and children. sources, Captain Jack was described as a sad and beaten man. According to one soldier, it was a sad thing and a sad ending for a man who with less than 70 men had defeated the army repeatedly for seven months. The trial at Fort Klamath lasted from July 5th to the July 9th. Captain Jack, Scunch and John, Boston Charlie and Black Jim were brought to a scaffold in Fort Klamath on October the 3rd. 1873. At 10.15, the nooses were fitted carefully. There was a slight delay while a soldier trimmed Jack Captain Jack's hair to ensure a better fit. An officer then moved from man to man, bidding them farewell, and black hoods descended over their heads, cutting off forever from view of the familiar world. At 10.20, the, the captain dropped his handkerchief, and an assistant cut the rope, holding the drop. As the drop fell with a thud, a half cry of horror escaped the spectators' mouths. A wail of anguish went up from the stockade. The bodies swing round and round. Jack and Jim apparently dying easily, but Boston and Scunchin suffering terrible convulsions. They all were pronounced dead at 28 minutes past 10. The surviving Modocs were exiled to the Midwest, where they received a tract of land two and a half miles square to live on in poverty. The Modoc War was over. <laughs>